Welcome to the Hangar Z Podcast, brought to you by Vertical Helicast. In this two-part series, we're honored to sit down with Bobby Swartz to discuss his remarkable aviation career. Bobby's military aviation story began with naval aviation flight training from 2009 to 2011. In 2012, he completed the MV-22B initial pilot qualification and underwent rigorous flight training, laying the foundation for a career filled with notable achievements. Bobby's career trajectory led him through various impactful roles within the Marine Corps showcasing expertise in flight leadership at every step. He initially served as a ground safety officer at VMM 561 in Miramar and VMM 265 in Okinawa, Japan, while continuing to learn the Osprey. His dedication to safety and excellence has been a constant thread throughout his entire career. The majority of Bobby's career was spent at VMM 161 in San Diego at Marine Corps Air Station Miramar, where he held key positions such as Director of Safety and Standardization an aviation safety officer while attaining night systems instructor and flight lead designations in the Osprey. Bobby's dedication and excellence led him to Washington, D.C., where he was assigned to the prestigious Marine Helicopter Squadron 1, a.k.a. HMX-1, which is in charge of transportation of the U.S. President, presidential staff, and dignitaries worldwide. Since leaving active duty in 2021, Bobby's earned the title of First Officer in a major U.S. airline, flying the 737 and continues to serve the United States as a Marine Corps reservist flying the Osprey out of Miramar. Thank you to our sponsors, Bell, Dallas Avionics, and Shotover. Cheers. Welcome to the Hangar Z Podcast, brought to you by Vertical Helicasts. The Hangar Z Podcast is the first and only podcast dedicated to promoting and exploring the personnel and equipment behind the missions in public safety aviation. Join your host, John Gray, Jeff Ratkovich, and Jack Shanley. Still southbound, skidding to a stop. Stand by here. Looks like you're getting ready to bail. Heads up, guys, bailing. Okay, the guy, he's running through the house, jumping the fence, through the shotgun, threw something out. Grabbing the shotgun. Don't go over that fence. Don't go over that fence. Grab the shotgun again. He is armed. Stay there. Hold your position. Four on the stop. Good advising, Coach Four on the stop. Hey, welcome to Hangar Z Podcast. I'm your host, John Gray. Uh, with us today for this conversation is Tony Weber, our new co-host. How you doing, Tony? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me back. It uh, appears the dynamic duo is back together again. So uh, I'm excited <laughs> about this uh, this podcast and the the guests we're going to have tonight. Heck yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you've you've co-hosted uh, once before. We're at Echo in San Diego. You co-hosted an episode with with the SR3 boys. That was awesome. I see you wearing an SR3 sweatshirt. So still repping the SR3. Oh, yeah. I'm giving the boys a little love tonight. So to my SR3 boys, how you doing out there? I hope you enjoyed the podcast. And man, was Echo a good time. Yeah, we had we had some fun there. Looking forward to this next year. They just announced the location. It's going to be in Virginia next October. So looking forward to that. For today's conversation, uh, we brought in somebody who's flying the uh, MV-22, the Osprey. And I'm going to say before we even get started talking about it, that I'm a complete nerd when it comes to this aircraft because I love it. <laughs> it is the coolest aircraft I think I've ever seen. I mean, it, it's an airplane and a helicopter mixed together. So to, to do that, uh, we brought in Bobby Swartz. Not Schwartz, but Swartz. Um, good job. Good job. <laughs> to talk about it. And, and man, beyond the aircraft itself, looking at your career and the things that you've done is, is absolutely amazing. Uh, yeah, flying the presidential... HMX one and just having the opportunity to live in that that part of the country and, and participate in those kind of things is really neat. So excited to to dig into that. Before we do that though, we gotta get into the hot seat and drink of the day. We'll start with drink of the day. We're recording it's you know first part of January, you know, post holidays. The holidays are always really heavy with all the food and, and beverages. So uh made the decision to go with a dry ish January for, for this year. Haven't done it before, but I thought I'd give it a, a shot. Uh, so for today, I wish I was drinking a, a North Park Brewing IPA. That would be my go-to for this conversation, especially with Tony in the house with some San Diego breweries. But uh, today I'm drinking TV Static. It's a, <laughs> it's a Kirkland brand uh, grapefruit. So that's what I'm drinking, and it's out of my first responder Whiskey Society cup. Uh, we went to their holiday party this December. It was actually in San Diego at San Diego PD's POA building. And uh, they were selling these these pint glasses. Really cool. So uh, anyways, that's what I got going. Bobby, let's transition to you. I didn't really say hi to you yet. So hello and thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Happy to be here. Yeah. Heck yeah. What's your uh, what's your drink of the day? 
that was my drink of the day. It was a Wisconsin specialty here. Some of you may have heard of it. But it's a uh, New Glarus Spotted Cow. And uh, one of my most often used yeah. for Bama Yacht Club koozie. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so I hear there's a story behind the koozie. I think this is probably the best time to, to get into that. Oh, man. Let's go for it. <laughs> so to lead into the story surrounding the koozie, Tony, can you kind of set the stage here? Well, um, so with the whole drink of the day, I was, uh, for the listeners that don't know, Bobby is my son-in-law. So there's this kind of a uh, fun uh, podcast for me as I have my son-in-law, Bobby, on the show. And the whole dry January thing, I was back with Bobby and my daughter, Ashley, for Christmas. And I actually had quite a few of those spotted cows that he's drinking. <laughs> and so I am also doing the dry January, drinking a fancy uh, sparkling water. But to move forward to the Florbama, uh, many of the conversations I had with Bobby over the years uh, when he was in Pensacola, this bar kept coming up by the name of Florabama, or is it Florabama? I don't know if I'm saying it right. You're, you're pretty but close. It sounds Flora like it Bama. has a, a rich history. Florabama, and uh, he has told me some stories about it, uh, about its rich history and how some of the uh, military hangs out there. And so uh, hopefully you can tell us a little bit about that bar now and some good times that you had there. Yeah, absolutely. So uh Right at the start of naval aviation training, we all start out in Pensacola. When we got down there, uh, you know, we're looking for a place to live. Everybody's excited to be in Florida. And uh, so you look for a place on the beach. I happen to know some friends that actually lived. We ended up living basically across the street from the Floribama. Um, and it sits right on the Florida-Alabama line on the beach. And at the time, there was a big backlog to start flight training. And uh, so we spent a lot of time over there. You know, both on the weekends and not, but got to know some of the locals, got to know uh, <laughs> some of the some of the traditions of the Floribama. And so that's a place I've been back to several times while I've got the time off, you know. And uh, took Ashley that's there. Cool. I've had I've had my bachelor party there. So there there's a lot of family history at the Floribama. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. It it sounds like kind of a rite of passage for aviators passing through flight school down there. Yeah, every, uh, I guess it would be every Sunday when the Blue Angels come back into town, they do a flyby with their smoke on by the bar. It's one of their things that they do oh, coming home nice. also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So normally yeah. at the at that bar, there's a heavy military presence, obviously. Yeah, you, you definitely get a mixture of the locals, of uh, military who's living and, and training around there and kind of everybody in, in between. They call it one of the great american roadhouse is kind of oh, oh that's awesome if those walls could speak i'm sure there's some stories oh, to be yeah. told from there <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> well you brought spotted cow uh, our friend nick from icarus he uh he's from wisconsin also and he uh he gave me a, a i think it was a 12 pack he, he brought a 12 pack of that in a one of those pelican type cases for me and i i I'm trying to remember where it was he delivered it it was at my house i can't remember what he was here for but he uh, he brought it and introduced me. That is a good beer. So I'll, I'll cheers you guys, even yeah. with our uh, cheers, boys. Alcoholic, uh, driest January drinks. I cheers. wish I was having a spotted cow. Well, yeah, stoked to to have you here, uh, Bobby. I'm not sure if you've listened to the podcast before, but after the drink of the day, we usually hop into what's called the hot seat, and it's just a an opportunity to break the ice, kind of some random questions that, that go along with the conversation. So uh, for this set of questions, I've asked or I've written down three would you rather type questions and again they're just kind of icebreaker uh kind of random questions the first one i'm assuming you grew up kind of in the 80s like i did and uh mullets were kind of kind of popular oh yeah so yeah it was it was the the mullets and the rat tails were popular and then the bull cats were also popular in the 80s those kids he, he put the bull over head and it, i think it's a lot of the kids whose parents couldn't afford a haircut which <laughs> yeah. you know i i may have been in that at some point but they put the bowl on top of your head and just cut literally on the bowl. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like Ralphie from the Simpsons. Yeah. Uh, or, or Bruce Lee. The Bruce Lee look. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, would you rather have a mullet or a bowl cut for the rest of your life? I would say I've had a bowl cut, I think, at one point, And I don't think I want to go back to that. 
And uh, <laughs> I would definitely say that the mullet would more kind of more about the, you know, whatever business in the front party in the back. I think there's a lot to be said for that. <laughs> uh, kind of uh, along the same lines of work hard, play hard. That's the thing I try to do a lot of. Um, so I, I would oh, definitely say awesome. that that fits me a lot better now. Yeah. It's funny. The mullet is coming back. I see a lot of the kids that are my kids age, they're junior high and they're rocking mullets now. I'm like, Oh man, it's, it's weird to see. Cause I was in junior high when that was popular, you know, back in the eighties and I'd had a, I'd wear a, an LA Dodgers hat kind of up high and had the Zach Morris wave my hair and then the mullet in the back. It was really oh, bad, man. I got to see a picture. That. I got to see a picture of that. <laughs> I've buried those somewhere. Okay. Um, Tony, how about you? Would you rather have a mullet or a bowl cut the rest of your life? Dude, that is an easy one. I am rocking the mullet all day long. <laughs> I can go to a monster truck jam, fit in perfectly. I could probably still go to country Western concerts, still fit in. So it's mullet all the way for me. I could see you with a mullet and like an ACDC shirt and a beer. Like that's Tony yeah. Weber right there. You nailed it. <laughs> yeah, I think I'd go for the mullet too. Uh, the bowl cut. I don't think that's ever been in. I don't think that's ever no. been a thing. It was just a, it was kind of a byproduct of the, of, you know, the financial times and not so much a, a, a statement. So I think I'd, I'd go with mul the mullet, unfortunately. All right. We're unanimous on the mullet. I like that. Yep, we are. The other thing we do with, with these questions a lot of times is talk about food. Uh, a lot of random questions surrounds food and, and you don't have to answer this question, but one of the ones we ask a lot is a hot dog, a sandwich and is is a uh, cereal, just cold soup, like those types of things. And this is kind of in the essence of that. The question is, would you rather eat a sand sandwich or drink a pint of glue? Oh, wow. I think <laughs> I would like to say, I think a sand sandwich would be easier to get through <laughs> than a pint of glue. And I've probably had some sand in my food along the way. I might not even notice. <laughs> yeah, I guess it depends on how much sand is going to be in there, right? And I th you think about, they're kids. There's always that one kid in your in your early elementary school days that like glue. So some kids might choose glue just because they like it. And then we all been to the beach, and your mom, you know, made you a tuna sandwich, and the sand is automatically drawn to that tuna sandwich. So it's kind of a sandy sandwich. But I, I would go for the the sandy sandy sandwich as well. So we got two out of three. Tony, what's your what's your call on this? I've, you know, I've already thought this through. The only way I'm drinking a pint of glue is if I've gone to Mexico and drank the water. Otherwise, <laughs> I'm going with the sand sandwich <laughs> all the way. So, so far, we're unanimous. This is great. Yeah. yeah. All right. The next one, I have this irrational fear of spiders. I hate spiders. I hate spiders and clowns. The two things I hate the most. <laughs> uh, so this question kind of has to do with that irrational fear of spiders. Uh, would you rather be trapped in a small room with 10,000 tarantulas for 10 minutes or would you rather eat 10 tarantulas in 10 minutes? I think I can hopefully fend for myself <laughs> for that long. <laughs> I don't know about getting the 10 tarantulas down in that amount of time. Yeah, 10,000 tarantulas, a lot of tarantulas to meet a room with. Like I just, they, they cover your body, I'd imagine. I guess it depends on how big the room is, right? Yeah, yeah. But eating, I think of eating 10 tarantulas, like if I had a knife and could cut them up, eat them a little bit at a time, you know, I think I could do that. I couldn't shove the whole thing in my mouth. That's disgusting. <laughs> so, yeah, that's kind of my thought there. But do you, do you hate spiders like I do? Uh, I, it comes in waves. It depends on how I notice them and what they're up to, I think. If they surprise me, I probably don't like it. If I get to come up with an idea to get them, then maybe they're all right. <laughs> I'm sure somebody listening is like, oh, they're good for the environment. They eat bugs. They do, but I still hate them. They're disgusting animals. <laughs> <laughs> Tony, how about you? I'm doing my best mosh pit impersonation and I'm stomping. <laughs> I'm stomping them as much as I can because I'm definitely not eating 10 of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, a little bit of division here, but uh, but I still I like the answer. I like yeah. the mosh pit interpretation. <laughs> I can see with your mullet and your uh, ACDC exactly. shirt yep. moshing around yep. with 10,000 spiders. Absolutely. But, yeah. Well, that's the hot seat. Except oh, just some, some randomness to, to break survived. the conversation in. <laughs> you survived Dude, the 10,000 spiders and the Sandy sandwich. I do not know how you come up with these questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Bobby, thanks again for, for joining us. Um, again, going through your background. It's really interesting. I'm excited to hear about you know how you got to these different positions in your life and 
Um, what you're doing now is really interesting too, as an airline pilot. We didn't bring that up yet, but you had an interesting adventure today to get back to where we are and to to join us this conversation. And uh, I'm sure we'll talk about that at some point. But to start, can you just kind of walk us through, you know, where you grew up and and where you went to school and kind of how you got into aviation? Bell is proud to sponsor Vertical Helicasts and their vision to hold meaningful mission, safety, and best practice conversations in the helicopter industry. The lessons learned from these conversations will undoubtedly shape the future of both new and veteran helicopter operators. Yeah, so I initially grew up in uh, in the Midwest, a couple hours southwest of Chicago, a small town of Henry. Uh, it is on the Illinois River um, and small town, 2,500 people. I have a little competition with people that I'd normally win of fewest people in your high school class. There was 35 in mine. So it's not, not hard to win that one most of the time. Um, I initially I'd say came across kind of the interest of flying. I had some neighbors that were pilots and they all, they had kind of cool stories of their own. I had a neighbor uh, who was a Navy A6 pilot and then was in the reserves and uh, was eventually a Delta airlines captain. So I, so I like to say that's where I initially kind of thought of the idea that maybe that was something cool to do. Uh, another neighbor of mine was a, a little bit older. He actually flew P-51s at the old World War II, never in combat. Uh, and then and then he had a Stearman biplane out at his farm that he flew off of a grass strip. So those two interests and then combined with uh, my dad took me on a ride with a friend of his in a, in a small Cessna. And, I, and the whole thing seemed really fun to me. So I kind of got the idea from those places. And then I uh, was lucky enough to come across a job in high school. I had Before that, I'd been cutting grass until I got my driver's license. And then um, part of, there was a job shouting program at my high school where you could go, you know, go watch somebody do their job for a day. And um, I was actually able to get a job at a little airport about 30 miles away from from my hometown for a line service guy. So fuel and play is that kind of stuff. And that was simultaneous with starting my private pilot's license at the same place. Uh, so I spent a lot of time at the airport. Uh, I was initially flying Cessna 172s and then most of my time in a Piper Archer. The club had those and all the pretty good prices. Uh, when you look back at it, at uh, what it costs now to fly a little bit on your own. But so working at the airport, getting working towards my private pilot's license, I did all that in high school and then decided that I wanted to continue that in college. So naturally, the options were looking at the service academies. I was interested in the military. My dad was enlisted in the Navy. I had a neighbor who was a Navy pilot, and I thought, what ways could I be a Navy pilot? And that's typically through the service academy or an ROTC program. Um, so I was fortunate to get a, initially a Navy scholarship down to U of I, University of Illinois and Champaign. And that really interested me because they had a four-year aviation human factors program. And I think you guys just had somebody else on that kind of went through the same program down there. So that was cool. That program gets you through uh, your private instrument commercial and then multi-ratings. Uh, and that was all Pipers. And and then that led through the ROTC scholarship. Eventually, I, I decided I thought that Maybe if I didn't get jets in the Navy, I'd, I'd end up on a ship that I didn't want to be on. So the uh, Marine Corps, I did not know much about at the time, but they were offering aviation contracts. And so I had to go up and get a flight physical. And then you kind of knew that when you graduated, uh, that you would have a flight spot. Um, so after the four years graduating, I got commissioned a second lieutenant, knew I was going to be flying. And uh, first, we have to go to the basic school in Quantico, Virginia. That's what every Marine officer goes to do. And that's all infantry-based training, kind of. So you don't get to have the fun of flying yet. You got to kind of earn your earn your stripes a little bit there. Uh, but then that eventually took me to Pensacola, worked through that. And then, and then you know, a lot of things along the way we'll continue to talk about. But the, the initial love and what I knew there was something I wanted to do was definitely um, – you know, I would say after soloing and spending the amount of time at the airport as I did in, in high school. Working on the, the fuel line, did the pilots that came through, did they kind of, you know, lead you with some information and some advice on, on how to pursue what you ended up pursuing? 
I don't know if they did directly or indirectly, but it, I had never even really thought of that job as work. I liked going up there at the end of the day. A lot of times I was even doing it after track or cross country practice. And I'd, I'd go up even for two or three hours. Um, and that job was, you know, like I said, it was washing airplanes. It was sweeping the hangar, but most importantly, spending time out there and understanding all the people that are around what the aviation community is. Um, and whether that's pilots coming through or pilots that like to just come out and watch other airplanes or the guys that actually own planes uh, out there at that same little little field. Uh, so it, it definitely quickly became a love of mine. And it, it's something that I haven't looked back on yet, I guess. You know, that was almost 20, 20 years ago to where I'm at now. When you were at that job at the airport, what what age were you? When I first started, I think I was 17, uh, and then and then uh, I worked there until I went to college, really, just so right around the age of 18. Okay, so the 18-year-old Bobby, in your mind back then, what did you think you were going to end up doing if you had your choice? Did you have kind of a goal at that point, or was it, hey, let's just... I think long term it was to get to where I'm at now, but there's so much. It seems like such a big mountain. There's so many things to do. It seemed like a lifetime before that would be a, a reality. Once I got interested in the military options, I started pursuing and learning about those. Definitely at that time, you know, I thought that I wanted to go fly jets. That was the thing to do. So I was doing that. That to me was kind of the first step. You know, you look at the mountain, then you look at the steps. And I knew that to keep flying, I wanted to have college, that be a part of my college, and then also have kind of, a, not necessarily a guarantee, but that the next step after that would be flying either the Navy or the, what ended up being, you know, the Osprey later on. That's cool. I, to, to be able to immerse yourself in the world that you want to eventually end up working in is genius. You know, I wish at my age I had known or thought to do that because, man, you just you're just immersed in that world. And you, like you said, you, you kind of just being around it, you learn a ton. And you know, that I can't think of a better way to kind of get into the field by, than by doing that. So that, that's, that's really cool. I definitely think it was my dad that was, that was giving me the opportunities, showing me those things right off the bat, you know, the first flight with his friend and then helping get me into the flight club and, and doing the training there that, Definitely all it takes is a good first step, like you're saying, right to your point. So you end up going down to Pensacola after Quantico. And uh, I'm assuming that's, you know, you talked about the the, the floor Bama and the time you spent there. Um, so I'm already kind of, the the, pink, the picture's being painted. It's, it sounds like a pretty awesome place outside of where it is by itself. Uh, the culture, the traditions that are there sound pretty awesome. Can you talk about what that experience was like and, and flight school itself? Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, we all start and go through pretty much all of the flight training the same way. Uh, and it all starts there in Pensacola. And so the first step is kind of like ground school, if you will. Uh, it's, you know, getting all the aer aerodynamics classes. It's, it starts off in the classroom and kind of ends up in the, in the pool. And that's just all of your basic qualifications in order to safely go get in a training aircraft. Back then it was still a T-34 Charlie's is what we were flying the tur turbo mentors. I think they're all gone now. I don't feel that old, but when your planes used to fly, start not flying anymore. You start to feel that way. Um, so from there, you know, you're going to go fly. Everybody goes to fly a single engine turbo prop. And for me, that took me to Corpus Christi, Texas. Uh, some people stay there in Pensacola at Whiting field. But I, I was in a squadron that went to Corpus Christi. You, f you finish primary flight training and then kind of a combination of your training scores, a little bit your preference and some luck of the draw of what's available at that time. Uh, you kind of rack and stack what you want and then the availability that's there. So finishing primary in the T-34, honestly, the Osprey was my number two choice. It didn't work out. I had the scores. Uh, to go fly jets. And for a lot of guys, that's your first reality of, of what the military is going to be. You can put your preferences in and do what you think you want and do everything in your power. And it doesn't always work. Um, in, in the end, I think it's typically a blessing in disguise if you just continue to go on that next path. 
Um, so for us from there, it was back to Pensacola for training in the TH-57, uh, the Bell Jet Ranger. Uh, they were still flying B and C variants of that. And it was kind of unique as an Osprey guy. They don't put us through the typical whole syllabus there. It was a pretty abridged syllabus. Uh, we didn't solo. We didn't do cross countries. It was really about the exposure to the aerodynamics, a helicopter flying, hovering techniques, a little bit of form techniques, even though a lot of those do turn out to be a little bit different in the Osprey. It was a good overall introduction exposure uh, to that kind of flying. Going back to before you, you joined the Marine Corps, you talked about going to, to, to get your private rating. Did you end up with your private before you went? Yeah. So I had my private pilot's license before, right before I went to college. And then there at U of I as an aviation human factors guy, uh, was private instrument commercial multi is what I left there. Oh, uh, okay. So it did give me a good head start for sure. That was my next question is how'd that play into your training, uh, with Pink, at Pensacola? So it, it definitely, um, I knew all the basics, right? I mean, talking on the radios, controlled airspace, general aircraft systems, while they were different in a turboprop a little bit than the piston planes I'd been flying, um, I'd say it gave me a, a real good, I could focus on perfecting things instead of initial exposure. And, and there, there was eventually a time where that gap is closed through the training pipeline. But I would say definitely in the primary stage, it was a, it was a big help, and, and uh, it definitely gave me a head start. Bobby, when you're going through those phases in Pensacola, and I'm talking about ground school, going through all your different flight phases, are people uh, getting washed out for not making the grade? Um, and if they are, talk a little bit about that, the, the making the grade, uh, your scores, how people can get washed out, and if so, how does that happen? So there, there's definitely uh, grade keeping. I think the on the academic side, you could maybe kind of go on set on a couple of tests before you kind of got a magnifying glass placed on you. Um, the obviously had to have some confidence in the pool. I honestly don't recall people in my class that didn't make it through, but I, but there was I would say there is a minority that. Uh, you know, very small percentage of candidates that could come run into something that holds them up. You know, the pool would probably be the next best example of, you know, can you swim a mile in the pool? Can you dive underwater? Can you put all the flake gear on and, uh, and do that kind of thing that, that I didn't come across very many. A lot of people I was going through it from the Naval Academy that had a lot of exposure to stuff like that. Um, but there were opportunities along the way that you did still have to make the grade um, for sure. What was your experience transitioning from the airplane into, into your training in the, in the helicopter? Uh, so going from airplanes to helicopters, the, the, I, what's kind of funny is I remember from playing some video games, it, I, it honestly kind of helped me in my brain to, cause there were things that were different, you know, um, flying a helicopter with a, with a, with a cyclic is different than an airplane with a joystick. Um, but there, there was enough similarities and the kind of connecting the dots in your, in your brain of, you know, forward doesn't necessarily mean that, that you're going down, you know, that you're going to descend. Um, it's that coupled with other flight control inputs that really turns into a good building block for the Osprey when you introduce the fourth one for us, which is the rotation of the, of the engines. Um, so I, I think I, you know, the, the hovering, they introduce like everybody else, kind of one piece at a time. Just first, you just get the cyclic, then you just get the rudders then you get two of the three, then you get the collective and, you know, so they did a really good job of stair stepping it for us. And then I only had about 30 hours in the helicopter, so I wouldn't say I ever got really comfortable in it, uh, right. but that de definitely enough for the training to be accomplished and, you know, really just the hover basics and that kind of stuff, uh, is really what translated next for us. I remember learning to hover was probably the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. It's def definitely the hum most humbling thing I've ever done oh, in my yeah. life. Very humbling. Yeah. I remember It'd be like, okay, stay in this, this, this little, this little square. It was like a 20 by 20 square or something. And 
And uh, I couldn't do that. Okay, so we'll, let's let's expand it. Let's like double the size of the box. And then eventually it's this huge field. Okay, just keep it in this field. And it was tough, you know. Uh, Tony, what was your experience like with that? Uh, the same thing. Very humbling. And I think everybody remembers the first time your instructor lets you take all three controls at the same time. And that's when you know you can't even keep it in a football field. <laughs> and that I think it is a, a humbling type thing. And then uh, it really makes you appreciate when you can keep it in like maybe a 20 by 20, you really feel like you're, you're slaying the dragon there. But um, <laughs> very humbling experience, uh, you know, and being a flight instructor and, and doing the same thing that uh, Bobby had done to him with a new student is you can look over there and go, yeah, I remember when that was me. And you can kind of feel their pain and know what they're going through. But uh, yeah, it, to start out, it is not easy. I remember that the first time, the, the first solo that I, I called it a solo, really the instructor just got out and let me hover around the pad without him in there. But I remember he got out and I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to kill myself. You know? <laughs> <laughs> this guy's not here to save my life. Your safety uh, blanket is gone. Yeah. <laughs> So we were in the R22 and and I'm wearing sunglasses in Long Beach. So it's not hot. And it's, I, I think it was, it was winterish time. And uh, he gets out and all of a sudden it te- the temperature goes up by 5,000 degrees. I'm sweating yeah. bullets. <laughs> I'm, the sunglasses I'm wearing are fogged over now because of all the sweat that's come down my face. It was disaster. Wow. <laughs> that's a so, good one. It's funny though. I mean, it, once you get through that, you know, at some point you're doing what you guys are doing, you know, and, you're hovering in really tight sp- spaces like Tony to, to either rescue somebody or you're dropping water in a fire or Bobby flying the, the Osprey and, and man, it's really cool to see the development of that. And as a CFI, Tony, I'm sure that's pretty cool to see your students develop through that path. Thanks to our sponsor, Dallas Avionics, who provides innovative products to law enforcement, the Department of Defense, Homeland Security, Military, Air Medical, Search and Rescue, and Special Missions Operations. Dallas Avionics distributes OEM equipment, including communications equipment, digital audio systems, PA systems, flight tracking, and other mission-critical devices. Visit DallasAvionics.com for more details. Oh, heck yeah. Um, And I know Bobby will segue into it at some point, but um, we were at... Miramar with him, giving them their yearly aerial firefighting refresher. And uh, he took me and a couple of the other pilots into the full Osprey Sim. And you would be amazed be already being a helicopter pilot. Once I got in the Osprey seat and he explained the controls, the pedals and the stick were the same. That was, I was, I was amazed. I didn't think that the Osprey even had that. And then the collective is more of a fore and aft power with a thumb wheel for the nacelle, right, Bobby? I got yep, that right. Yep, you got it. And st- once he once he explained that, next thing you know, I'm flying underneath the Corn Auto Bridge, having a great time. And <laughs> and then yeah. you know he explained how to put it into a hover, and it was amazing how many for me the similarities between a helicopter that went into the Osprey. I was I was shocked. Yeah. Yeah, that Osprey is an amazing machine. Cool, you got yeah. to do that. I'm, I'm yeah. jealous. It was fun. Uh, going back to you, Bobby, and the in the selection to Ospreys, uh, can you talk about your initial training and that, what that was like, and kind of how to, what it felt like that you'd flown airplanes and s- some helicopters, and now you're flying this kind of combination of the two? Obviously, still as of right now, there's no trainer for the Osprey, right? So the best trainer that we had was the flight simulators and in uh in new river north carolina where our initial training squadron is um they have a couple i think it was two when i was there but full motion simulators and then several other of the same controls same setup but no motion Uh, so before you ever got in the osprey you had been through a pretty good indoc syllabus if i I don't know the total number they're doing now, you know, somewhere around 15 simulator events doing all the basic air work, basic patterns, uh, those kinds of things. The way I describe it to people, uh, even with the little bit of helicopter time I, I had is that it was kind of like being a skier and jumping on a snowboard, you know, or vice versa, kind of whatever your thing is. Uh, the first few times, really, this only happened in the, in the simulator for the most part, but you know, it was kind of, not knowing what inputs to do to get the result that you wanted. 
And the simulator really helped with that to the point that uh, I remember a first flight in the Osprey, you know, off of the runway there at, in North Carolina, I was able to do that takeoff. You know, at that point, you'd done it in the simulator enough times. You, know, you could take take off, you could transition, you could fly to the training area where you continued to do more of the same, you know, basic air work practice. Uh, but yeah, I, the easiest way I say is like learning a new sport or something that eventually the muscle memory lines up, but uh, there's definitely a little bit of a learning curve. I still haven't learned to snowboard. I gave up after a day, <laughs> but um, that's, that's what I think it would take to get through that learning curve. So you talk about helicopters and airplanes. People say a lot of times airplanes want to fly. So, you know, a lot of times, and it's not true all the time, but sometimes you can take your hands off the controls of an airplane and it's going to keep doing what it does. Helicopter doesn't want to fly. You take the hands off the control outside of autopilot and it wants to do its own thing. What was your experience with the Osprey when it, when it comes to that? Does it want to fly? And I know there's different phases of flight, but it's with this flight control computers and, and you know the fly-by-wire stuff. Sometimes we say uh, jokingly that you know we're a voting member of deciding if that wants to fly or not. <laughs> so the the main inputs and stuff. I think it's every obviously every bit as complex uh, as as a helicopter. You know the aerodynamics of that thing is definitely technology and computers making that thing get in the into the sky. It doesn't feel like that to the user, but kind of in the back of your mind, you know that there's a lot going on behind the scenes. Uh, in order to make that happen. I, I think it's actually a good opportunity to jump ahead a little bit and talk about the safety record of the Osprey. Uh, I know prior to talking to you, uh, Skip Robinson was a, a friend of mine. He was a vertical photographer and he was enamored like I am with the Osprey. And he recommended a book that I, that I bought and, and read through. And from what I recall in the book, a lot of the, the, the safety issues were in the you know, infancy of the program. And as you talk about the the software coming online, that more of the wouldn't call it fly by wire, but that type of technology as that developed, it became a really safe program. What's your experience, and what would you talk about when it comes to the safety of of the Osprey? The Osprey, like we're talking about, is it's a very complex plane, and um, the safety record that it has come to hold is honestly very similar as any other military helicopter or jet or fixed wing plane. Um, so when you look at, at the stats, that's really what you're going to find is that it is not any more inherently dangerous than any of the other planes that we're flying. There's been examples along the way of aerodynamics that are unique to tilt rotor technology. And, you know, unfortunately, sometimes those are learned the, the hard way. And those are some of the things that are different from a helicopter to us. And initially, you know, initially there was a big mix, but probably mostly helicopter guys flying the Osprey, you know, just because that kind of looks like it's the more natural guy to transition. The aerodynamic, you know, if you if you cross under instead of over, you're a lot more susceptible to the asymmetric roll uh, that has been a causal factor in some mishaps. You know, there's things that can happen low to the ground with the aerodynamics unique to us that pose itself to a threat. And now that changes the procedures, that changes the SOPs going forward. We've learned... Um, some hard lessons around the ship, you know, we'll talk about some shipboard deployments later on, uh, but there's very interesting aerodynamics occurring around the structure of a ship. Also, when you've got one rotor that may be over the deck and one that's 80 feet down to the water and, and in the way that we've incorporated, you know, software upgrades or power margins or things that we've done to make that a more safe environment along the way, it's an ever changing thing. Yeah, I mean, even just recently, uh, after some things, you know, it's almost, you almost have to remind yourself that, that we're all almost still test pilots. A lot of us still think of ourselves as test pilots, as Osprey pilots, but I, I've mentioned that, you know, in the, in the last year to, to some guys is that really a lot of things that we're doing, you know, I've been flying it for, for 10 years now almost, but we're still learning new things as we go and trying to incorporate those. You, you can never, as an aviation safety officer, I like to say, I'd love to get to a place where you could never have any mishaps. But as we all know, there's a lot of factors out there that can play a part that it's almost impossible to eliminate all of those. Um, but as long as you continue to grow, continue to improve, it's, it's been a, a challenging aircraft at times. You know, it had its hiccups in the 80s and 90s. 
Uh, we had some really good runs in the fleet. And then, and then every now and then some things will string, you know, one after the other. And maybe they're related to the same thing or maybe they aren't. But it's, it's those things that I think is still moving forward, learning, incorporating, updating that, that I know we're still trying to do with the, with the Osprey. But in general, you know, like, like we were saying, I get that, asked that question very often of safety record or maybe bad impressions of the plane. And, and I don't feel that way as, as an operator of it. Um, I obviously love to go fly the plane as often as I can now, which hasn't been a ton lately, but that's all right. But in, in general, I have all the confidence in the plane, especially with the capability that it brings that is so u- unique to, to the tilt rudder. Yeah, it, it accomplishes a lot of a lot of different things in one machine. Kind of like to hop to that for a minute and talk about some of the capabilities of the aircraft. Go into some of the dimensions. I told you I'm a nerd and yeah, really yeah. enamored by this thing. So I I've seen them obviously in in person and in in flying. And every time I'm like, holy cow! And for those that haven't seen them, can you talk about you know the size of of the aircraft? Uh, maybe from from tip to toe to start, and then kind of the wingspan stuff. So it's actually wider than it is long. Um, it's, it is 84 feet wide. If, you, if we have the nacelles all the way down from rotor tip to rotor tip, it's, it's about 84 feet wide. And then it's only 60 feet long from nose to tail. So you're, you're wider than you are long. And then the unique part that was built into the design for the shipboard capabilities is you know, you've probably seen us fold up where we fold the prop rotors in. The wing rotates, and the interesting part of that is then it's, it's only becomes 16 feet wide. So that was a design requirement in order to stack them on board ship. You know, if you had a bunch of 84 foot wide planes, you couldn't get very many on a, on a tight ship or down in the hangar. Um, so it can go from very wide, obviously, to to fitting on sh- on board ship. We would take 12 of them with us uh, when we go on the boat, along with several other types of aircraft. And then the, the rotor diameter of each one is 38 feet on each side. So that's obviously what gives it that width. Um, and that was what struck me the first time I was up, up close to one was that it was, it was shut down. It was stationary and static, but with the rotors all the way down, you really get a feeling of how big that rotor diameter is, but it may not always look like that. And it can't take off like that. The rotor tip path plane would go below the ground if you were all the way down on the downstops. It is, it is larger. I think it was larger than I thought it was going to be the first time I was up close to one. Yeah, it, it's an amazing machine. When when you talk about uh, the like the the V and E and like the cap- load capabilities of it, what what's V and E in that? And then can we get into like what you're seeing transported in it outside of troops? Top speed is two two eighty. 280 knots. We're typically cruising around below 10,000 feet, you know, which then we're limited to 250, but it's still a pretty good spot for us. So 280 knots, kind of our max gross weight can get as high as 60,500 pounds, which is really putting a lot of weight in that thing. And that, that it's not a weight we can do a vertical takeoff in. We're limited just over 52,000 pounds um, for a vertical takeoff. And kind of the differences of those, that's all in our load planning process is whatever the mission is, what type of torque margin we're going to carry, you know, impacts the amount of useful load is kind of what we call it. I think similar to the helicopter world, you know, useful load being how much fuel exchanged with how much cargo do I want to carry. Um, and internally, the old number was around 20,000 pounds internal. That's going to put you into that heavy category where you may not be able to do a vertical takeoff, uh, where we would then do the planning to do what we call a short takeoff or a stow. And we do that with the nacelles either at 60 degrees or 75 degrees. So then that incorporates airflow over the wings a little bit. You know, you don't have to just hold yourself up on the rotors and the shaft horsepower. You can use more of the aerodynamics uh, built in to accomplish that lift. But typically on a, on a given day in SoCal on a training, training flight, we probably have around 15,000 pounds that we're working with to incorporate safety margins. Most of that on the training flight would be gas, but I've done some other flights either with uh, heavy cargo, some vehicles. There's, um, we've got about five pallet positions inside. So as heavy as you can make a pallet, you know, really the, 
the heaviest things we can carry in that space are, are typically the extra fuel tanks. We can bring additional internal tanks that would take up a pallet position. And now you're exchanging. That's really just kind of for ferry or maybe a really long distance flight. You'd put one of those on. We can carry 24 troops. Typically, we wouldn't say combat, fully combat loaded troops just because it may be too heavy. So they've got a lot of packs, a lot of gear, a lot of Pelican cases, you know, it's all, it's all based on what weight they're carrying, what they're prepared to, to do. There was other kind of smaller uh, UTVs, kind of like a Polaris Razor, you know, that the Marine Corps had. Those fit well in the back of us. That sounds fun. A, pl- a Ranger inside of an Osprey. <laughs> they can get those in pretty good. I get asked a lot of times, does a Humvee fit in the back? And the answer is no, it's too wide. Um, we could, we could maybe externally lift one. We don't do a lot of external lift. We, we, uh, we have that capability for single and dual point stuff. And we leave that more to our CH 53 brothers that that's their, that's more their neck of the woods. We like to say we can go faster and further, but may not be able to do the heavy lift that those guys are designing. Bobby, a question for you real quick. When they, when they made the Osprey, was it made to fill a specific niche and did it replace a certain helicopter? Yeah. So all the squadrons that became Osprey squadrons were traditionally CH-46 squadrons. Um, And it it had the same general mission set of uh, assault support, uh, CASAVAC, medevac kind of stuff, you know, cargo operations. It had many of the same roles and traditionally before the Osprey, it kind of expanded the distance and range. All the helicopters were kind of in the same playbook. So it operated, it integrated very well into that plan. I, I can't quote this really the specifics off the top of my head, but you know, there's some uh, Marine Corps doctrine out there for over the horizon capabilities. And that's really a great example of what the Osprey can bring with the increased range that rather than having to be within sight of the shore, launch it from a ship. You know, we did training flights uh, before where we've gone almost a thousand miles from the water to, to the shore. And to get back, that would need some air to air refueling or something like that maybe, but it brings the type of capability that is y- unique as opposed, especially to the, we, there's many things the CH-46 did better than the Osprey. And so we don't always like getting compared exactly to what we replaced, but it definitely fits the same mission set. We could do this, most of the same things, maybe not land in as small of LZs sometimes, but we can do most of the things that it did pretty well. And then some of our own things and completely new, newer capabilities that bring a lot to the combat commander, I guess, is kind of how we describe it. Can you? Talk a little bit about some of the offensive and defensive weapon systems that that uh, that that thing employs. Thank you to our sponsor, Shotover. Shotover Systems is the leading developer and manufacturer of high-performance gyro-stabilized cameras with advanced real-time AR mapping and mission management, all backed by unparalleled custom training and support. Now offering the M2 multi-sensor system, Soul 6 axis EOIR platform with 4K Ultra HD color and infrared technology, ideal for law enforcement and defense. Offered with real-time AR overlays to quickly identify streets, weather, and traffic, automated license plate recognition, 24 megapixel digital photographs, and automated steering and tracking. As far as offensive weapons, what I always tell people is that's, that is the 24 grunts in the back with their weapons. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's the number one offense that we're trying to bring is, is getting you know, up to 24 guys in the zone at the right time, at the right place, so they can go do the damage. We, we don't currently have, well, most of what we have, I guess, is a defensive capability. We have a normal ramp-mounted uh, tail gun that could be either an M240 or a 50 cal off the back, and that's where our crew chiefs are fully in charge of that, of employing that weapon system. Unfortunately, I don't have a trigger for anything up front. I don't get to have any of the fun, but mostly a defensive capability uh, is what we bring. And then, and then we rely on our, our escorts a lot. So, you know, we train primarily to have escorts such as Cobras and Hueys, uh, Harriers can fill that role. 
We've done some training and some operational stuff with uh, A-10s, are a great kind of uh, speed similar aircraft for us. You know, there's been some cool packages put together with a C-130 tanker, a couple A-10s and a couple Ospreys can kind of bring a real, a real cool capability out there. So yeah, very, very versatile on who we can play with at what speeds and at what ranges. Aerial refueling has always intrigued me. You know, I I feel like that's got to be a skill. It's super difficult. Can you talk about your experience doing that in Osprey? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's, uh, it's a thing again, we kind of always do the crawl, walk, run stuff, right? So we had to do it in the sim quite a bit first. And a lot of guys say it's actually a little harder in the sim, which is nice. If you can get that figured out and get everything trimmed out and stable, you know, when you move over to the aircraft, everything, you know, with your peripheral vision and depth perception and everything, it makes it a little bit easier. But we are, we've got our, our prop rotors very close to the tail. The C-130 is what we, we aerial refueled off most of the time. Uh, they have approved us to do some, some air refueling off of additional uh, jet tankers now. Uh, I, I actually didn't get the chance to do that. I, I've only tanked off of C-130s. But yeah, it's definitely like golfing or something. The more often you do it, the more comfortable you feel. If you haven't done it for a while, you know, you kind of get the sweaty palms. And and you, I, there was a first instructor of mine that talks about wiggling your toes. If you just, because you're tense, you don't know you're tense until you think about it for a second. You go, man, I am really gripping everything. And and so when you learn to wiggle your toes a little bit and get it trimmed out, kind of take some of the forces off, it should be like anything else. It should be a fingertip type of type of flying uh, if you get really good at it. Um, so, yeah, def- definitely a challenge. Does the uh, Osprey have any type of SAR capabilities? Not all of our planes do. So we do have a hoist off the tail that has been employed. Okay. Um, there was That was just kind of starting to come to be. Uh, we had a couple of them in the squadron, I think on one of my first shipboard deployments. And, and again, typically we're not the perfect candidate for that, right? That's normally a SAR minute. We've got a SAR debt of H sixties on the boat with us. I would, I would trust those guys, highly trained, qualified with a rescue swimmer to do all that. We don't inherently have a rescue swimmer, but sometimes for a risk mitigation, if, if they weren't available, if they were tasked, if they were in, during maintenance. You know, we were kind of an acceptable backup plan. You know, we, in, we could go hover kind of the same reason we've got the long tether on the fire bucket that we were going to talk about is our downwash is a lot more violent than what a helicopter is. So in order to combat that, we do things a little higher. Um, so I, I, I don't know the specifics of the missions. I know there's some guys over um, kind of, in the Middle East region that have done some hoist operations off of, I want to say it was a cruise ship uh, that made the, made the media. So there could be the same type of thing. It could be out, outside of the range of your typical hoist capability that in extremis, you could go out there, lower a hoist. I don't know if they had a, a rescue swimmer with them. Like I said, we don't typically send a guy down on the hoist, but you could send a basket absolutely down on a hoist and and bring them back up into the tail that's something i'd say that we're still getting better at that is a capability we haven't used a ton but we have demonstrated that uh, time and place that it is a capable platform of that that's awesome you think of a super long range rescue mission where a helicopter may not be able to make it and that seems like it'd be a good a good spot for that you brought up the the fire bucket and i want to talk about that you guys start talking about it and when Tony described it at first and think that there's a meme that's gone around, you guys have probably seen it. And the, the, the person's sitting in a really cool car in a parking lot. And it's like, you think you're the coolest guy in the parking lot. And this guy shows up and I picture Tony with his, you know, really cool bell 412. And then here comes the Osprey and like get shown up by this thing. Can you talk about, and actually let's shift over to, again to you, Tony, uh, the training you guys did at, at Pendleton. Can you talk about the training, what you guys are doing and how that kind of lent into training with the Osprey? Yearly, we give aerial firefighting training refreshers to Camp Pendleton, North Island. And we even included one year, it was Bobby's squadron at Miramar. So I think it was right before your deployment, wasn't it, Bobby, that we were having it up in Pendleton up near K Springs. And we were giving it to the uh, helicopter guys. And Bobby and I had talked a couple of weeks before that. And he goes, hey, I'm going to try and, you know, get to your training 
with an Osprey from Miramar. And I said, oh man, that'd be great. Never saw it. And so we had been up uh, in the middle of Pendleton all day and we were in a, a Belf, one of our Bell 407s and we're doing the Helco roll up around a thousand feet, 1500 feet and calling in the helicopter drops. And it was the, uh, for three quarters of the day, it was all the helicopter guys from Pendleton calling in their drops. We had a, a dip site. And I remember uh, sitting in the helicopter flying, looking at my watch going, it's coming up on four o'clock. I don't think it's going to happen. And then out of the blue, I hear Bobby on the air and he's coming. And <laughs> I saw him coming up from the West and uh, it was pretty amazing to see an Osprey show up with a, was it? A, I think it was a hundred foot long line. It was a pretty big bucket, but that aircraft made the bucket, you know, look, look like, look like a Dixie cup. <laughs> and so I said, Hey, the dip side is yours. And we just sat there in an orbit and, uh, we were pretty amazed to see an Osprey come in and, uh, do some dips and, uh, some drops. But Bobby, from your perspective, the CRM involved in, you know, doing bucket drops and talk a little bit about how your crew chiefs are involved. Uh, you know, are they describing bucket in the water, easy down, come up? Who's making the drops, if you could uh, go into that for us. But uh, it was pretty amazing to see. Yeah, no, it, absolutely. It's definitely a day that I'll never forget as well. And it, like you're saying, it was we were having a little bit of a maintenance struggle uh, at the squadron down at Mir, Mir, Miramar, but we were able to borrow a plane, and I hopped in and said, hey, you know, we had approval to go go do it. Everybody was signing off. But uh, I was I was – I was determined to make it out there that day to show show Tony <laughs> that we could drop water too. Oh, he um, showed me. So yeah. So initially, out in o Okinawa, Japan, when I was there, is where we were some of the first Osprey guys to get to. Besides the test guys that had certified it, uh, to kind of operationally stand, you know, what we call it a fire bucket standby, and that was just because of the absence of helicopters that used to be stationed out there. We became the only asset available. And so we got that bucket out there. So that's where I really learned the CRM and the training. And so it's initially, it just builds on our external capabilities. Uh, for me as the pilot, it's very similar to external ops uh, on a much longer line, right? So the CRM gets a little more specific. Normally, you know, we're down at, at you know, 20 feet or so doing normal external ops for a pallet or something. Uh, so it's a lot higher. And requires the crew chiefs to participate a lot more. So they're in control of when to, to drop. They are absolutely calling us down to the water. The normal calls, the buckets in the water, buckets filling, buckets full, clear to come up. Um, you know, very standard cadence. I haven't heard the cadence in a while. So I, I probably, it's probably something has changed along the way. But, uh, but yeah, they were absolutely uh, keeping us steady. And we're, we're using our hover capability, what's unique. Uh, I don't know if other helicopters have this, but in the Osprey, when we hover, our, we can choose which screen. we got two, two screens, but uh, one of them will turn in to a, a, a hover page is how we describe it, but it's really showing your drift vector. So you're just turning into playing a little video game almost. Of You can see on your own if you're forward, back, left, or right. And if you keep that thing centered, you know you're steady. And that really helps for these high-altitude hovers of keeping yourself steady in a good spot. Um, so that coupled with the crew chiefs, letting us know how the bucket's reacting, you know, is, is all CRM is very intensive in that. And then also, like you mentioned, the hundred foot tether, hundred foot tether, another 30 feet for the bucket and its connection. And so we get, we got to be careful, you know, that while we think we're 200 feet over the ground or the trees, you know, that bucket may be a lot closer. So it, it is a lot of, a lot of paying attention of uh, where that thing's at and how it's operated. And, and it, you know, it's a 900 gallon bucket. We wouldn't always fill it all the way up or get it all the way up. But even when it's almost full, if you're pulling 7,000 pounds trying to pull you the outside of a turn, you can definitely feel it sometimes uh, pulling you left and right if you weren't ready for it. So when you're coming in for the drop, is it 100% on your crew chief to estimate how high the bucket is off the ground? when you're coming in to actually uh, let the water go? So, or do you, you have, know, the, or are you going off a rate out? Yeah, we would, the rat out would still be working. The bucket doesn't block that for us. Okay. So typically, you know, we'd be 
200 feet or so, knowing that the bucket's 75 feet, 70 feet over, over the drop site. And we'd also try to keep the speed up. You know, one of the things that people talk about, well, Osprey is going to fan the flames and, you know, create more, more damage or accelerate the fire maybe more than, than it should. But, you know, the argument I've made to that a lot of times is our normal drop speed was 50 knots. We were well above translational lift, not really creating a lot of downwash, especially at the altitude that we were at. There could be there could be some some after effects, but uh, typically we were at a high altitude. We'd slow down, keep it just above translational lift. We'd let the crew chiefs know that the the site was coming under the nose. You know, they'd call it from from the the, the hole by the external point, and then it was up to them. Then they got good at it too. The ones that had a lot of practice. They they started to learn the arc of the bucket, or you know, if we needed to turn a little bit here, here or there. Um, so with a lot of training, those guys got pretty. The more, yeah, the more you do, the, the better you get at it. Yeah. Now, did you have a, a set V and E for a full bucket and empty bucket? We we would never pull it around in air, airplane mode. You know, we'd stay the the different modes. That was that was kind of one of the unique things the way we talk about we're we're either in airplane mode which is air the the cells all the way on the downstops we call it conversion mode when we're kind of helicopter speeds or VTOL if you're just doing a straight hover mode kind of thing so it, externals and uh, this fire bucket stuff was typically only done in conversion mode so for us normally speeds less than 120 knots um, I don't recall if there was an actual speed on the bucket itself, but we, we normally wouldn't go too much faster than a normal kind of 80, 80 knots uh, in a pattern working that stuff. 80 knots is the norm. Yeah, that's a norm for even helicopters, empty or full. It was just a safe across the board, 80 knots. You wouldn't exceed that. And I would think with even with an Osprey, that's a pretty safe margin right there even though you had it on a, a hundred foot long line but man when we saw you guys doing that and I, you know i'm flying the aircraft just going oh that was so <laughs> cool just to watch i mean when you guys came over the water and then leaving and then coming back around making the turn uh i'll have to show john i do have a video of it i saved it and it, it's a pretty cool video because how often do you see an osprey you know doing bucket work so i've always saved that video oh cool you, you talked a little bit about hovering and the, the VTOL mode. Can you talk about kind of some of the some of the dynamics of hovering that machine versus a helicopter and what you're feeling with it? This is the end of part one of our conversation with Bobby Swartz. Stand by for a message after a word from our sponsors. Bell is proud to sponsor Vertical Helicasts and their vision to hold meaningful mission, safety, and best practice conversations in the helicopter industry. The lessons learned from these conversations will undoubtedly shape the future of both new and veteran helicopter operators. Thanks to our sponsor, Dallas Avionics, who provides innovative products to law enforcement, the Department of Defense, Homeland Security, Military, Air Medical, Search and Rescue, and Special Missions Operations. Dallas Avionics distributes OEM equipment, including communications equipment, digital audio systems, PA systems, flight tracking, and other mission-critical devices. Visit DallasAvionics.com for more details. Thank you to our sponsor, Shotover. Shotover Systems is the leading developer and manufacturer of high-performance gyro-stabilized cameras with advanced real-time AR mapping and mission management, all backed by unparalleled custom training and support. Now offering the M2 multi-sensor system, Soul 6 axis EOIR platform with 4K Ultra HD color and infrared technology, ideal for law enforcement and defense. Offered with real-time AR overlays to quickly identify streets, weather, and traffic. Automated license plate recognition, 24 megapixel digital photographs, and automated steering and tracking. Thank you for hanging out to hear from our sponsors who make these conversations possible. This was an awesome conversation highlighting the Marine Corps Ospreys, but I do want to highlight one of the nonprofit organizations we've partnered with and support, which is the Battalion Blue Skies Foundation that provides post-mishap support for the Army aviation community and its families. The Blue Skies Foundation is part of Battalion who makes apparel for aviators by aviators. They created a Battalion Hangar Z collaboration line of shirts that can be found at www.battalion.com. 100% of the Hangar Z proceeds 
from the sale of the shirts go back to the Brotalian Blue Skies Foundation. So be sure to check it out. Time to close up the hangar. Thanks for joining us on the Hangar Z podcast, brought to you by Vertical Helicasts.